today, Lord. We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor that is due your mighty name, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, worship with us today as we sing. Oh 
Once we know you, we know your name, you're stuck. And we want to know how you're doing. We want to support you. We want to be there for you. So thank you for being here today. You've walked into a family today. I can assure you that. Um, this is a special service today. We got a couple things going on. Um, but we actually are representing our graduates today. And um, we have a, yes, and a hand clap. Um, we actually have a very
very special video presentation that we want to show you at this time. So if you will please turn your attention to the screen. Congratulations and your applause and standing. You can be seated. This is something that we do every year for our graduates because this is a uh, yay car car, she said. <laughs> this is very uh, a very huge milestone for, for someone in their life as they've graduated high school and now deciding to move on and uh, deciding where they will attend a college and, and moving on with their life and somewhat independent for mom and dad thank you jesus amen no 
but we we do uh, we want to honor Carson today and and uh, all of his achievements and everything that he has done. Carson, um, for many of you, you know that Carson is a lifelong member of Life Restoration Center. For those of you that may not know, Carson is my wife and I's middle child. Now, uh, he's outgrown me, uh, taller than I am, but when we were youth pastors, uh, when Carson was born, so ministry life is all he's ever known. That's all he's ever known, and if you don't know, if you've never watched Carson, Carson is a worshiper, and he is a prayer warrior. Not just here at church, but he lives it at home, and he lives it at school as well. Uh, we, we've walked into his bedroom countless times to find him in a time of prayer and seeking the Lord, and that, that does more good for our heart than anything could ever express. Carson is a part of our prayer team here at LRC. Uh, which is one of the dream teams and as a part of that team Carson has taken on the responsibility of covering the youth group and his youth pastors in prayer and he faithfully does so he's always willing to do anything that we need him to do here at LRC anything from speaking in the main service to teaching in youth class to bringing up the pulpit each week I had to bring up my own pulpit today y'all saw that he's slacking no I'm just kidding and you say, well, that's not really a big deal. No, it is a big deal because that shows the servant's heart that he has. Uh, you say, well, that's not, that's not a, a big ordeal. No, it, it is it, because we need somebody to do that, and he's willing to do so. And when I thought he was going off to college far, I was like, my Lord, we're going to have to find somebody else now to pull, bring up the pulpit. But thankfully, he's going to be close. And so he, he's, he does that week in and week out. If there's a need, he's always willing to fill it no matter how big. Or how small it may be and so as a, a church body as a church family we are thankful for Carson for his service and for the manner in which he represents our church outside of these four walls he has been a huge and tremendous blessing to this church Carson graduated yesterday May the 25th from Easley High School and uh, Carson has a 5.4 weighted GPA amen he, he had to get his smarts from his mother because I, I was never that smart. And uh, he, he's ranked either three or four out of 402 students, uh, which we are still waiting on his final transcript to, to confirm that ranking. Uh, his, his class rank awarded him uh, the honor to lead the prayer at his graduation ceremony yesterday as a distinguished honor graduate. Amen. My wife and I were talking, and we, we said it couldn't be more fitting for someone when his principal, his principal called him and said, I need to see you, and we're like, oh, boy. We knew he didn't do anything wrong, but we didn't know what was going on. But his, his principal asked him if he would be willing to, to do the prayer at the graduation, and, of course, he, he accepted the invitation. And there were about, I don't know, probably 5,000 people in the, in the arena yesterday, so that's a big deal. And he was given the opportunity to lead in prayer. And so in addition to his high school diploma, Carson was awarded the South Carolina Academic Honor Award. He's also been awarded the South Carolina Palmetto Fellow Scholarship. And due to his GPA and class ranking during all four years, he was named an Easley Rotary Club Scholar each of the four years and, and lettered in academics all four years. Carson is a member of the National Honor Society, the Spanish National Honor Society, Mu Alpha Theta, the, and during his senior year, he served as a teacher cadet at Croswell Elementary, uh, where he assisted second grade students uh, with reading and math skills. Carson has played basketball since he was the age of three, and he had a genuine love for the game. He was captain of the boys' varsity team, and he lettered in basketball his sophomore through senior year. He was awarded the McKelvey Student Athletic Scholarship and the South Carolina High School League Student Athlete Award. Carson has taken uh, numerous AP and dual enrollment classes while in high school, for which he has already earned college credit for. And these credit hours allow Carson to enter college as a sophomore. And so he has chosen to attend Clemson University. Thank you, Jesus. Y'all know my oldest went rogue and uh, decided on the other school down south, and we're not going to talk about that. No, he... 
Carson had a, a tough time trying to decide between Clemson and South Carolina, but he, he ultimately chose Clemson, uh, where he is the re recipient of the University Academic Scholarship, and Carson will major in health science pre-professional student studies, and uh, he will live on campus being this beginning this fall, but we're thankful that he's close enough still to attend LRC every weekend. So just a few achievements of, of what he's done, and we're super proud of Carson and, and all of his achievements and everything that he's done, and uh, we, we couldn't be more proud. And so as we do with, with every graduate, we like to present them um, with a Bible, um, just as a reminder that as you move forward, as you go forward, to keep God in your life, keep the Word at the forefront of your life, and as you pursue and seek God with everything in you, then God will ultimately lead you and guide you and to where he wants you to be and what he wants you to do. And so this is just a little token of appreciation and thank you uh, just for all that you've done. And so it's a Bible with your, with your name on it. Avery and Gadiel, can, I know, I mean, what, you going to take pictures? Oh, oh, she has something. Gadiel, will you come up here too? My wife, will you come up here? And we're going to, you got something? We decided, as your youth leaders, to give you a little gift to add with your Bible. Um, it's just a bookmark with a scripture, and uh, it's got to Carson, 2024 graduate from Gadiel and Avery. We love you very much. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. And so this is what we want to, I want to ask you to stand one more time. Well, actually, probably not one more time, probably several more times, but just, <laughs> just stand right now. And I want you just to, to stretch your hand this way. And we want to pray over Carson. And uh, y'all come in here close to. And y'all y'all lay hands on him and help us pray. And we want to pray that the Lord will just guide him and be with him and cover him. This is a, a new territory, one he's not experienced yet. And we just want the Lord's blessing to be upon him, the Lord's favor to be with him. And we just want to pray that the Lord will just guide him and order his steps as he continues to move forward in the path that the Lord has for him. So will you help us just pray right now and lift your voice? Mighty God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. Well, this has been awesome. Amen. We're, we're super proud of Carson. And uh, I've got one more. One more to graduate. I'll be able to sing freedom. <laughs> Not really. We love him. Rylan, if you can put the baby down and come back up here to the keys for me. I want to do something. Y'all can be seated, and then I'm going to have you stand probably just one more time. Unless you decide to stand on your own. And I, I'm, I hope you do. I hope you'll preach with me when I get ready to preach. I've got a word today. I believe the Lord. I, I want to share with you the Lord has given me. Um, some things and showed me something different that I've never seen and I hope you will receive it and hear it and accept um, what the Lord um, is going to speak into this house. But before I get into the word, um, I have asked um, Sidney and his precious wife were here last week and I didn't know that they were coming. They surprised us and walked in on us and uh, these are uh, used to be neighbors of, of the pains 
and uh, so they they have come to the church here several times and and were here and uh, he he was he came was it around Easter or was it Easter or was it right at the week after Easter the week after Easter he was here and uh, man we had a, a move of God and the spirit of God was flowing in this place and and uh, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna steal it but I, I I told Sydney he came up to me last week. He was him and his wife were here last week and surprised us, and I didn't know they were coming. And uh, he came up and talked to me after service, and I was like, "Listen, I need y'all to come back next week because I need you to testify to the whole church." And and by the time he came up and told me last week after church, a lot of people had already gone and left, and I was like, "I need people to hear this." And unfortunately, there are still a lot of people out today. I guess because it's Memorial Day weekend. And I understand a lot of people are traveling, and it's a long weekend, and people have plans, and that's that's well and good. But um, but I asked Sydney to come back today um, for a, for a purpose. So Sydney, if you if you'll come up, or if I can meet you down here, whatever you're comfortable with. And I, I just want I want him to spend about five minutes or so and and, and share and give a testimony about what the Lord has done uh, in his life. year uh, more than two points and uh, he said that that was obviously not a good thing <clears throat> and uh, from the PSA we went and had a MRI and the MRI showed that uh, I had a mass and for the te second time, uh, a medical professional had told me that I had cancer. So even uh, in my walk with Christ, even with my relationship with Christ, I felt uneasy when he told me this for the second time. Oh, my Lord, Jesus, look, what have you done? And as I began to, I'm not going to say worry, but as I had some great concern, I think we can all understand that when they use that, that C word, uh, uh, it, it, it might shake you up just a bit. So, Obviously, I began to pray, and there's a few prayer warriors that I, I, I spoke to and in confidence told them what was going on. And a Sunday morning came about, and I no longer lived right in Simpsonville next to my neighbors, my buddy, my family. But I lived up in Spartanburg, but something told me to get up this morning and, and come on down here. So as I came to share his word with you all here, he then put it in my heart to, to testify. Let the pastor know what's going on. So I stood right here and and told you all what was going on and pastor you not only did you come down and lay hands upon me there were some other brothers and sisters who loved the Lord that laid their hands upon me and and I tell you I, I walked out of here that day <laughs> understanding a few things and, and what I understood first was that when them boys was on that boat and things got to be a little shaking and rocking and, and, and they were worried, they walked with him and knew what he did. 
But he said, oh, ye of little faith. See, there, there was a time when I thought that maybe he didn't know. Maybe he didn't hear what the doctors were saying. So a week or so later, they said I needed to have the biopsy. So nothing comes quick. Biopsy, yeah, you need a biopsy, got to get it done. Three weeks later, I go in to get the biopsy, finally. Now I got to wait for results because they don't happen like right afterwards, right? So I got to wait for the results. So the results came back, and they, I first saw them in my, in, in my, in my app on my phone, and I, I wasn't clear. I wasn't really, no, does this mean that? So I go to the post op, and he says, well, they took 16 samples. And all 16 samples came back for none. <laughs> so, so the happy dance and shout started right there in the office. And, and, and in our times of troubles, sometimes we, we forget. He has been with us from the beginning. He has carried us from the beginning. So don't you ever, ever, ever give up on Jesus. Ever give up. When the tough times come, we just got to continue to call on Jesus, continue to trust in the Lord. It's what we do. We can't fight this on our own. But when we call on Jesus, we can get that supernatural healing. One man can say yes. Two men can say yes. But I tell you what, I got a God that says, no, no. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We serve a mighty God. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you. <laughs> Come on, can we rejoice with Sydney today? Come on. Has God ever done anything for you? Has God ever made a way when there was no way? Has God ever stepped in just right on time? I'm talking about an on time God. <laughs> Woo! He <laughs> It's stuff like that that'll make you say, way maker, miracle worker, <laughs> promise keeper, <laughs> light in the darkness. <laughs> oh, it's my God. <laughs> I said it's my God. <laughs> He's a miracle worker. <laughs> He's a promise keeper. <laughs> He's the light in the darkness. <laughs> no matter what you need. No matter what you need, we serve a God that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power. <laughs> Y'all better be careful. Y'all better be careful. Somebody's about to get loose in this house. Something's about to be set free in this house. You better be careful. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Woo. 
Somebody shout, thank you, Jesus. Somebody shout, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel a spirit of worship in this house. I feel a spirit of praise in this house. Mm, he's a way maker. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, we worship you, Jesus. <laughs> we worship you, Jesus. There's none like you. There is none beside you. Not one can compare to you, holy God. For you are high and lifted up, and your train fills the temple. God, I thank you for every victory you've given us. I thank you for every battle you've already won. I thank you for making a way where there is no way. I thank you, oh God, for healing my body. I thank you for providing for me financially. God, I thank you. I thank you for covering me. I thank you for protecting me. God, I thank you for blessing my finances. I th oh! My God, my Lord and my God, he's great and mighty. He's great and mighty to be praised, the Holy One, the Righteous One. <laughs> None greater than my God. That's all right. Some of you say, Yo, why are you so fanatic? Because when I think of Jesus, when I think of all he's done for me, I can't help but be quiet. I'm like the prophet said, it's like a fire shut up in my bones. I've got to get it out. I've got to let it out. I've got to let him know, God, I give you praise. I give you glory. I give you all the honor because there's... Why are you acting so crazy, Pastor? Because God's been too good to me. I don't care what you think about me. My praise ain't for you. My praise is for him. My pro. You can sit back and make fun all you want. I know there's probably some of y'all saying it don't take all that. Well, it may not for you, but it does for me. Because a good God deserves good praise. A great God deserves great praise. Hey! I wish somebody understood what I'm trying to tell you today. That God's been too good to you. For you to sit back uh, with a scowl on your face, looking around, wondering why we're praising God like we are. Listen, I'll tell you, if you knew where he brought me from, if you knew where I used to be, I used to be addicted. But some, oh, one day he come in and set me free. I used to be an alcoholic. I used to be dependent on alcohol. But one day God stepped in and turned it all around for me. I used to be broke and disgusted, but somehow God stepped in and lifted me up out of the miry clay and set my feet on the rock to stay. Almighty God. So somebody out saying, well, Pastor, <laughs> why, why are you acting like that? 
because I want you to know that if he did it for Sydney, I said if he did it for Sydney, it don't matter if it's cancer. It doesn't matter if it's the flu. It doesn't matter if it's a job situation, a financial situation. It doesn't matter if it's a family situation. If you'll just release it to God and say, God, I don't understand, but I know you're faithful. I don't understand, but I know you're going to come through. I don't understand, but I'm going to trust you. My faith is in you, and I will not waver. So I want you to know that if he did it for Sydney, he'll do something for you. Some of you have come into this house today bearing burdens uh, and needs in your life, uh, and you just don't know which way to turn. But I've come to tell you, if you look unto the hills, uh, from whence comes your help? Uh, your help uh, comes from the Lord. My Lord and my God. Y'all done got me started and I've got announcements to do, but. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's something stirring in this atmosphere right now. There's something happening right now. <laughs> The same miracle working God that performed a miracle for Sydney is going to perform some miracles in this house today. I feel a miracle in the house beginning to transpire. I feel a miracle. Come on. If you're watching online today, I speak a miracle into your home. I speak a miracle into your vehicle. I speak a miracle into your life. And if you're in the house today, I've come to tell you God is going to do a miracle in this house. Well, how do you know, Pastor? Because I feel it. I feel the stirring. I feel. <laughs> Just like he told young Timothy, stir up the gift of the Holy Spirit within you. And when you begin to stir up the gift, something begins to happen. Something begins to move. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, if you're worshiping, keep worshiping. If you're not worshiping, high five your neighbor and tell him God is good. All right, brief, briefly, brief. let me do these announcements, and then, I, and then I'm going to get into the Word. I'm telling, man, oh, man, I'm telling you, God is going to do something in this house today. I feel it, I feel it, I feel it. Listen, today, today, after service, immediately following service is life group kickoff for our summer sizzle, our summer semester. And our summer semester is only six weeks long. Um, so we need you to go to the fellowship hall. And we've got the groups uh, already set up for those groups that we're going to have over these six weeks in the summer. And we want you to sign up. Find you a group. Uh, and I, I'm, don't overextend yourself. But find you a group to sign up, maybe two if you want. And, uh, and be faithful to that group if you can. And uh, there's going to be free food after service. So we're going to have all the food ready. Um, so you just walk over to the fellowship hall, grab you a plate, sit down and eat. And then go and sign up for some life groups. And just sit down and have some fellowship with, with the people of God. Amen. This Wednesday night after prayer, we don't, we don't have a typical Wednesday night Bible study, but we have prayer on Wednesday nights. And so this Wednesday night is prayer. And uh, so after prayer, we're going to have a graduation party for Carson. So you don't want to miss that. We're going to have free food for there too, no, no charge. So come and congratulate Carson on his graduation and uh, be there and help support him. The last IEF camp fundraiser, our youth camp, is coming up July, beginning July 1st. You don't want to miss that if you have teens. 
They're having their last camp fundraiser this Saturday, June 1st, from 10 until 1 p.m. here at the church. They're going to be doing car washes. And so if your car's extra dirty, <laughs> come by and let them wash it. Now, they're, not, they're not charging anything in particular, but they just say whatever the Lord lays on your heart to donate um, to the youth group um, as a fundraiser. And so they're going to be washing cars from 10 to 1, so come by and get your cars washed and uh, make a donation to them and uh, help them out uh, to reach their goal and able to go to youth camp in July. Last announcement, VBS registration. Our VBS is June 12th, 13th, and 14th. If you have not signed your kids up or registered your children yet, please do so. You can do that through Facebook, through the website. Um, go there, register your, your children for VBS. <clears throat> and on also, if you're wanting to serve or volunteer for our VBS, we need you to sign up at the welcome desk on your way out. Just stop by the welcome desk. We've got a sign-up sheet. Write your name down, what you're willing to help serve in or participate. We'll put you to work. We'll give you a job and, and make sure that you're plugged in. Amen? All right. This wasn't on my announcements. I almost forgot. Don't, also, our First Steps program. We, we've gone to doing First Steps once a quarter. Um, so our next First Steps is going to be in July, beginning in July. So you don't want to miss that. Be here. Um, if you've not gone through our First Steps program, this enables us to get a feel for where you're at, um, to do a spiritual gifts assessment test on you to see what your giftings are so we know where to plug you in, how to use you, and what, what you want to do here in the church, whatever your calling is. So we want to use you. We want to put you to work. And so if you've not gone through First Steps, sign up at the welcome desk. We've got a sign-up sheet so we'll know how much food to prepare for you and, uh, and to be ready. So starting in July is going to be our First Steps. If you've not gone through any First Steps, sign up at the welcome desk and we'll get you plugged in. Amen? All right, stand one more time for the reading of the word. Hallelujah. My, my, my. Listen, I, I need you to keep that same, the, the same mentality that you had just a few moments ago before announcements. As I'm, I need you to preach with me today. I need some help today. If you're going to help the preacher, say amen. All right. Go to Matthew chapter 21. We'll begin reading at verse number... Um, 12, Matthew chapter 21, beginning at verse number 12. We are concluding today. We're concluding our series, Here Comes the Church. So today will be the last uh, sermon or, uh, and service on Here Comes the Church. We'll start something new um, next week. Um, but this is going to conclude this sermon series, Here Comes the Church. Matthew chapter 21, I'll be reading verses 12 through 17. And the Bible says, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables, or the, the King James says he turned over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Uh -huh. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law saw these wonderful miracles and heard even the children in the temple shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. But the leaders were indignant. They asked Jesus, Do you hear what these children are saying? Yes, Jesus replied. Haven't you ever read the scriptures? For they say, You have taught children and infants to give you praise. <laughs> Ooh, out of the mouth of babes. Then he returned to Bethany where he stayed overnight. I want to preach to you simply this thought, this subject, turning over tables. Turning over tables. I'm going somewhere. I just need you to hang with me. I, turning over tables. I, I, know, I know we've got things to do afterwards. I, I know we've got, we're going to have food prepared, and I know we're going to go over there and have a good time and sign up for life groups and eat and fellowship and hang out and, and converse, and tomorrow's a holiday, and most of the people are going to be off work tomorrow. Thank you, Jesus. And we're going to have a long weekend. It's going to be a great time with, with family and friends and grilling out and having a good time. So that means I can preach longer today. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to try my best to, to, to preach short, um, to give us plenty of time. But, but I also want God to do what he wants to do. I never want to be in the way of what God wants to do. Whatever God wants to do, we want him to do in this house here today. So help me pray right now. God, we, we come to you right now as we humble ourselves. Lord, we know that we are nothing without you, God. We are nothing but clay. 
God, you are the potter, though, and we're asking you to mold us and make us, oh God, into what you want us to be, the vessels, God, that you're calling us all to be. I pray, oh God, that you would open the heavens, oh Lord, and that your, your power and your spirit will begin to flow, God, in through this sanctuary. God, I pray the supernatural, God, would begin to move. I pray, God, miracles, signs, and wonders, God, would begin to stir in this atmosphere. God, I pray right now that you would stir up the gift within us all, God, as we begin to look unto you, the author and the finisher of our faith. I pray that you help us to open our minds, our hearts, and our ears and receive, oh God, what you're wanting to speak into this house, into this sanctuary. God will give you all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, amen. As you're seated, high five your neighbor and tell them, don't turn over the table. Amen. And I'll reiterate what Avery has already said. Thank you to every guest that is here today. Uh, we're so thankful that you're here. We hope you feel welcomed and loved, and we hope that you come back. If you're searching for a church, we welcome you to our family. Amen. <clears throat> Last week was Pentecost Sunday, and we learned about the suddenly that came into the upper room. And I've come to remind you today that your suddenly is coming. Just hold on. And so in our story today, we find Jesus going into the temple and turning over tables of the money changers. And this story resonates with some people because what Jesus did that day was probably the closest that we'll ever see him to actually losing it. You see, you've seen the, the meme on Facebook that says, the next time someone asks you what would Jesus do, remind them that flipping over tables and chasing people with a whip is within the realm of possibilities. Y'all, listen, y'all ain't got to act all spiritual on me. You know you've been there. I've been there. But the problem is, is that there are some people who seem to relish the idea of storming the church or even other people's lives and simply turning over tables. And there are some people that believe that it is their job to pass judgment on other people and other churches or even their own church if, the, if it does something that they don't like. I've seen it in this church. Something happens that someone don't like and they're ready to start passing judgment and ask, oh, help me, Jesus. And these people get bent out of shape over something or another and they come out wanting to turn over the tables. Maybe you've even seen the mess that somebody like that can make in a church. I've seen it firsthand. Maybe you've even felt the sting of their whip from time to time. And whenever anyone asks these table turners who, ha who gave them the permission to raise such a ruckus, almost without fail, they'll point to you what Jesus did in the temple. The problem is they don't understand Scripture. They'll say, I'm just going to do what Jesus did and chase the corruption out of the church. <laughs> I'm trying to be careful. So if you're someone who likes to go around turning tables over, there are some things that we need to go over. There are some house rules here at Life Restoration Center. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write these down. I want to give you three things that we need to remember before we start turning tables over. The first thing that we need to remember is we need to remember who turned the tables over. According to Scripture, we know that it was Jesus who turned over the tables. Now, I know someone may be asking, we, we are followers of Jesus. Aren't we supposed to do what Jesus did? Yes, most of the time. Just not when it comes to turning over tables. Because we don't have the authority to do so. I'm going to help somebody. Because when Jesus turned over the tables, he did it by himself. Okay? Now we, we read all throughout scripture when Jesus preached the gospel. When he healed the sick. When he fed the hungry. When he mended the broken. He brought his disciples with him. And he empowered them to do these things as well. He also sent them out to do them on their own. 
But when he went into the temple and started turning over tables, you know what we don't see? We don't see Jesus saying, all right, Peter and James and John, y'all come help me turn these tables over. That didn't happen. He never instructed them, and he never instructed us to do anything of the likes. But Jesus had the power and the authority to turn over the tables because of who he was, who he is. And so Jesus came into the temple that day acting in judgment. And we see all throughout the Bible that Jesus is the one who always turns over the tables. And whenever we try to do these things on our own, we get in trouble. So when you think there are some tables that need to be turned over, what you just need to do is go pray about it. What you need to do is put it into God's hand. Come on, somebody. I'm hurrying along. Number two, the next thing you need to remember is you need to remember who Jesus chased out of the temple. I'm going somewhere. I'm, I'm, I'm telling y'all, when the Lord showed me this, it just blew my mind. And I hope it does the same to you. Remember who Jesus chased out of the temple. Because people are eager to turn over other people's tables almost. They, they never consider that Jesus might turn over their table first. We need to understand why Jesus chased these people out. We know that it set Jesus off. It's just to the point he was almost, I mean, he was gone. And we saw, because we saw people buying and selling within the temple. But we need a little more context, so y'all go with me. Because if you go into the fellowship hall today after service and start turning over tables that have been set up for our summer sizzle life group kickoff, we're going to have a problem. The merchants didn't set up shop in the inner parts of the temple because they knew that was a no-no. Instead, they did their buying and selling right in the outer courts. And this, listen, this is where people came from all over the world to learn about God and to form a relationship with Him. It was a place on the outskirts where seekers came to worship and they came to pray to God. But that's also where the vendors were set up. Selling sacrificial animals. I need y'all to get a picture of this. By the way, I, y'all take note of this because you're going to need this a little bit later. Did you notice in the scripture that we read, the only animal or anything related that was mentioned was what? The dove. There's a reason. Okay, y'all, y'all write that down. Take note of this. You're going to need it a little later. Because doves were the sacrifices of the poor. And the vendors would gouge them on the prices because they simply could. And so now, do you see what's going on? Anybody ever been to a sporting event or a concert or any any kind of event and and bought concessions or bought merch? And you know how much of a rip-off it is? We were at the graduation yesterday, and they had the concession stand open. I was like, look at God. And I walked over there, and I thought about getting something until I started seeing the prices. And my dad come back and said, he bought a pack of M&M's. And he said, you know how much these were? And I took a guess, and I was wrong. He paid $4 for a pack of M&M's. And I said, you didn't see the prices? He said, no, not until it was too late. And so when you've gone to a sporting event or some, something happened and you go to buy con- concessions or merch, now, now imagine all of this going on where people are trying to worship. And people are trying to pray. And this is what made Jesus mad enough to go in and turn over all the tables. And that's why Jesus also said, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you've, instead you've made it a den of thieves. Because they were taking advantage of the people. Now, I want you to put yourself in their place. Maybe you've come to the temple and you don't know God. But you want to. You're an outsider. You're a stranger. You don't really know anyone. But you've come to worship and you've come to pray. But all the church folk are just walking by you too busy and too distracted to even notice you. And you're not on their agenda. And in fact... They act like you're in their way because they're trying to sell some animals and not one of them is making room for you. 
are you going to feel welcomed? They're treating you like you don't matter. And this is why Jesus was so angry that he turned over the tables and he began to chase the, these Pharisees and Sadducees out. Uh, they had gotten totally callous about what they were even there for. They had gotten greedy and selfish and entitled. And so they weren't making room for the outsiders and the outcasts. And that's why Jesus chased them out. He didn't just throw out those that were selling. <laughs> you ready? But he also threw out those that were buying. Help me, Jesus. I'll ask us the question, have we become like them? Religious salespeople and religious consumers, have we become entitled? Have we, oh, have we become to a place that we're seeking to be served rather than serving? Seeking our own private experience or our own comfort and convenience instead of seeking the lost? I thought you were going to help me preach. Are we ignoring the lost and the hurting and the lonely people while we're busy playing church? I'm trying. These religious sellers and consumers were in the way. And if Jesus, oh my God, have mercy. If Jesus were to walk in our church today, would he turn over tables? Oh, help me, Jesus. Would he throw us out? Because we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. Number three. We need to remember who Jesus led into town. And this is where I'm going. This is the part of the story that we almost never talk about. Because we usually stop at Jesus turning over the tables and chasing people out. But we don't, we don't wait to see who he welcomes in. And that's sad because that's the real work of the church. Turning over tables is God's job. What we're about to see is our work. Because the Bible says that Jesus led in people who were blind and lame. And then it says he healed them. Jesus turned over the tables and chased out the religious people in order to bring in the hurting and the broken and the lonely and the forgotten. They came to Jesus and he welcomed them with open arms and then he healed them. I've come to tell you, church, that's what we're here for. To welcome the people who are desperately searching for God. People who have been banged up by life. The ones who are in a struggle. People who are just barely hanging on. People who need friends and family. We're supposed to make room for them and welcome them into God's house. Because we need to bring them to Jesus so that he can heal them. Y'all with me? Shout yes. And so Jesus had to turn over the tables of the people who were in, into consumer religion and convenience religion. To the people who were mostly into God for personal enrichment. Who forgot that worship is as much about evangelism as it is a private experience with God. Who turned church into a social club? That's what they were doing. We're not worried about prayer. We're not worried about worship. Let's just turn the church into a, a, a gathering. Let's come together, have a good time in fellowship, and we'll, we'll all skip and hold hands going to heaven together. Listen, that sounds good, and then fellowship is vitally important. We've got to have fellowship with one another, but it's not the most important thing. Jesus had to chase everyone who sold that kind of faith out of the temple along with every, everyone who bought into it. Because the church is supposed to be a place where the broken come to be redeemed and renewed and restored by Jesus. A place where the lost and the lonely find a home. What happened around the temple with Jesus happens to God's people today as well. It's all throughout the Bible and all throughout history, but we lose the plot of the story. We get complacent. We, we long for convenience. Pastor, we need you to hurry up. we got somewhere to be. 
Listen, I, I understand things happen, and that's I'm not I'm not knocking anything. I'm just telling you as a whole, we've come into this place, this society as a whole, thinks that we're, we're in this microwave society that I've got to have it right now. And if you can't feed me in 2.3 seconds, then I'm out of here. I went to Zaxby's the other night for, for Ryland on my way home, and I, I, I ordered, literally, this is all I ordered. I, I ordered a, 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 a white cheddar cheese bites and a small french fry. And I pulled in Zaxby's, the line was wrapped around the building. I was like, well, I'll just go inside. It'll be a little quicker. There was nobody in line inside. I walked inside, and I stood there for 15 minutes after I ordered my food, and I was like, for one small french fry and a cheese bite. I know that's in the physical, but that's the way we are spiritually. If I can't get it now, then I don't want it. And we forget to make room for other people. And we bask so long in God's love and grace and mercy that we begin to feel entitled to it. Oh, help me, Jesus. And we are no better than the people who were buying and selling in the temple that day. Because every so often, we've got to be shaken from our complacency. Because Jesus has come along to turn over some tables. And sometimes the tables that need to be turned over are in our own hearts. Get this, if you're taking notes, you may want to write this down. Jesus had to heal the temple first so that the broken and the hurting could be welcome and healed. I said he had to heal the temple first before the people could come to be healed. <laughs> Sometimes Jesus has to chase out deep-rooted attitudes in our hearts. Like convenience and complacency and entitlement and instant gratification. Not knowing the difference between busyness and fruitfulness. We're busy. We're busy. We're doing the work of God. We're doing the work of God, but we're not seeing any fruit. I thought y'all were going to help me preach today. We can be busy all day long. We can have VBS all month long. We, we can go reach as many people and knock doors and, and do all these things and... and but if we're not seeing the fruits of our labor, then what are we doing? We're just saying we're busy and doing the work of God when we're, oh, help me, Jesus. See, Jesus has to cast those out all so, so that he can replace them with faith and joy. Listen, my prayer is that the people of this church would not go out from here looking to turn over anyone else's tables because that's not our job. You hear your pastor right now. There are people that are coming to this church. We don't see them yet, but I'm telling you, they're on their way. And when they step foot into this building, they're in need of healing of their brokenness, healing in their body, healing in their mind, and healing in their emotions. And they don't need you looking at them and judging them and wanting to turn over their table Simply because they don't do it like you do it. Or because they don't look like you look. Oh, I need some help now. Come on. We are a church of restoration. And we are a church for all people. It doesn't matter your race, your ethnicity. It doesn't matter how you dress or what you wear. You can come in blue jeans. You can come in shorts. You can come in a suit and tie. You can come in a dress. I don't care how you come. But just come. Because we want... We want to introduce you to a man named Jesus. It's not our job to be turning over people's tables. <laughs> Y'all ready? We need to be praying for Jesus to come turn over whatever tables need to be turned over in us. Listen, the moment you think you've got it all together, I beg to differ. You, <laughs> ain't nobody in this house perfect. There was only one perfect, and his name was Jesus, who walked this earth. And the moment you think you're perfect, or the moment you think you found a perfect church, you better not join. Because you're going to screw it up. 
Y'all go ahead and laugh <laughs> because there are some self-righteous people that think they got it all together and they're all this in a bag of chips. I, I hate to break it. I hate to burst your bubble, but you ain't there yet. I tell people all the time, I'm like Steve Harvey, when he said, don't trip because he ain't finished with me yet. He's still working on me because <laughs> I'm not what I need to be. But thank God I'm not what I, oh, <laughs> I'm not what I used to be <laughs> because he's brought me a mighty long. Listen, we need to understand that individually and collectively as a church, there may be some tables that Jesus needs to turn over. This is what I'm getting to right now. I got my landing gear down. I'm going to go ahead and close my Bible to give you all some hope. The ministry of Jesus was saturated with love and compassion and humility and forgiveness and hope. And we often ignore those things while preaching and pointing our fingers and talk about how Jesus cleansed the temple. Let me tell you what Jesus cleansed the temple of. He didn't cleanse the people. He didn't cleanse the temple of the people who were struggling. He didn't cleanse the temple of the people who were confused. He didn't cleanse the people of, of the temple of the people who were hurting or the mixed up people, but he cleansed the temple of religious Pharisees who had learned how to make money off the people. And they magnified their money-making schemes of religiosity and ignored the power of prayer and the hope that is found in Jesus. Listen. I don't know that Jesus necessarily got angry at the people, but I think he got angry at the religion. Listen, I'm not in this for religion, but I'm in this for relationship. Relationship trumps religion all day long. Y'all don't, I'm, okay, I'm not going there. Oh, help me, Jesus. So if you want to know what makes Jesus angry, it's religion. Pharisees, Sadducees. If you want to know what ruffled his feathers the most, it was the religious who stood on the corner prancing in their own righteousness. Y'all remember the story of the man standing in the corner beating his chest said, Lord, forgive me because I'm just a sinner. And the Pharisees stood over there and said, Lord, I'm glad I'm not like him. That's who Jesus is angry with. That's who Jesus is mad at. I don't know about you, but I have nothing to boast about other than Jesus in my life. Because I am nothing. I can't live. I can't move. I can't breathe without him. It's not about me, but it's all about Jesus and what he does through me. Listen, the problem is, is that we have lost love in the church. The church, oh my, Lord have mercy. I wish, I know we got people out cooking right now. I wish everybody was in here. Hopefully they'll go back and watch. The church, we listen, we have sat in our seats waiting on something while heaven has stood in attention waiting on us. We preach miracles and we talk about miracles and the supernatural and the gifts of the Spirit. And, and we say we want it, but we sit back and act like we don't. We sit in our seats waiting on something to happen in heaven saying, I just need you to speak a word. I just need you to worship. I just need you to lift your voice. And the Bible says that Jesus, uh, now, now this story is found in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But John is the only Gospel that I'm aware of that says that Jesus used a whip. And so he puts this whip together. And while he was doing so, I believe he was thinking about every Pharisee and Sadducee who had turned the house of God into a den of thieves. And this made him angry. But let me tell you. Let me tell you what won't make Jesus mad. The drug addicts. The alcoholics. The homosexuals. The prostitutes. The broken. 
the sick, the confused, all of these that are bound and looking to be set free. But the religious people that is full of hate and malice, that makes it difficult to access the power and presence of God. That's what makes God mad. And when we make it difficult for lost people to find God, he gets mad. And so when lost people come into the church, they're not looking for their table to be turned over. They're looking for someone to put their arm around them and say, listen, I know you're going through something, and I'm here for you. If you ever need anything, just let me know. You may fall down, but I'm going to be here to pick you back up. And so we make it difficult for people coming into the church to find God. And that makes him mad. Because though there are religious people in the church who have set up shop and told God that they don't need him because they figured out how to grow this thing and how to do this thing and how to organize and orchestrate the church. We've learned how to have church without the Holy Spirit and a move of God. I'm telling you the truth right now. Because there are a lot of churches that the Holy Spirit could be removed from them and they would go on operating the same as if nothing ever happened. Because they've learned how to have church. And so Jesus comes to the temple and starts using the whip he made on the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious people. And then he then goes over to the table where the thieves were in operation. What were they doing? The Bible says they were selling doves. This is where I'm getting to. I'm closing. Rylan, come. They were selling doves. All throughout the Bible, the dove is a symbol of what? Peace. What else? The Holy Spirit. The dove is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Y'all, don't miss this. Don't miss this. And we learned last week on the day of Pentecost that when they gathered in the upper room and suddenly there came a sound from heaven and tongues like as of fire sat upon each of them. You remember that? That was the dove landing on the body of Christ. Are you, if you're with me, shout yes. Because this is it. If you, if you miss this, you're going to miss the whole message. And so, we remember, we, you know, right, the, the, the church was birthed in Acts, right? The, the New Testament church, the, 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 the first uh, day, uh, the day of Pentecost was when the church was birthed. But we're looking in Matthew now, so this was before the birth of the church. And so when Jesus walked in the temple, don't miss this, and he turned the tables over of those that were selling doves, what he was saying was this house is supposed to have miracles and healing and deliverance and you've tried to put the dove in a cage. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Y'all, because I, I, if somebody had told me that, I'd have been. The day of Pentecost hasn't even happened yet. But Jesus was foretelling of what was coming. <laughs> what he was telling was, was that I, you've turned my house into a den of thieves but this is supposed to be a place of miracles it's supposed to be a place of healing it's supposed to be a place of restoration and a place of renewing but you're trying to you're trying to keep the dove contained and keep it in a cage and so Jesus did what only he knew to do he went in You're no longer going to keep the dog cage. You're no longer going to keep it contained. But I declare that this house will be a house of miracles. That this house will be a house of restoration. That this house will be a house of healing. What Jesus was telling everybody that saw him do so, he was telling them, I have come to let the dove loose.
Pentecost hasn't happened yet, but he's foretelling the Holy Spirit is coming and you can't contain it. You cannot cage it. If you'll tap in to what the Spirit is doing, you'll see miracles, signs, and wonders. I've come to tell somebody, here comes the church. You hear your pastor today. God is about to loose the dove in this church. I'm speaking prophetically right now. You hear me under the unction of the Holy Spirit. God is about to loose the dove at Life Restoration Center. God is about to loose the Holy Spirit in this house. And we're going to see people baptized in the Spirit. We're going to see people uh, receive miracles, Sydney. We're going to see people healed. We're going to see people delivered. We're going to see people restored. We're going to see people renewed. We're going to... God is about to turn some tables over in churches that have made the house of God a den of thieves. We cannot sell the Holy Spirit. We cannot turn the move of God into some kind of operation that simply produces money. This isn't about more money, but it's about more glory. Yes, the church needs its finances to operate. I understand that. But you hear me. I'd rather see this church house filled with broken people who don't have two dimes to rub together and God working and moving in their life than to have two or three millionaires sitting in these seats and nothing happening. Because it's not about the money. It's about the glory. It's about the Holy Spirit moving among us. This is about people who are broke and busted and disgusted and finding hope in Jesus. That's what we're all about. Life restoration is helping people find hope in Jesus. I wish somebody would shout, loose the dove. Somebody shout it again, loose the dove. Y'all stand with me. Jesus turned the tables over where the doves were caged. Yeah, I was going to say, put that back up. Ashley, Ashley does our graphics for our sermon images, and she's not, they're not here today. They're working. But she does a fantastic job. When I sent her, listen, she, she knows me evidently so well. Because I, I just usually send her the title of my message and the scripture that I'm preaching from, and she does the rest. I don't give her usually any, any inclination about what I'm preaching, about what I'm doing. And so she sent me this image back, and I was like, my God. I didn't even tell her what I was preaching about. <laughs> but when I looked at this image, this is, this is the picture I got in the Bible as I read the scripture. When Jesus began to turn over those tables and the doves that were caged, all I can see is just doves flying everywhere. And you know, uh, y'all ever seen a bird get into uh, constraints or into a house or something trying to find his way? They go crazy trying to get out. To, that's a, and can you imagine all these doves going, going wild everywhere? Jesus said, that's what's fixing to happen. I'm loosing the dove. I'm loosing the Holy Spirit. Here comes the church. Listen, you don't have to worry about turning over tables. Let Jesus do that. You just focus on him and what he wants to use you to do. Listen, this ain't in my notes, but I'm going to tell you right now. How many, by show of hands, how many want to be used of God? All right, so 100%. Everybody wants to be used of God. That's awesome. Well, I'm going to go ahead and help you. He's not going to use you to turn over, over other people's tables. 
That ain't your job. Your job is to love. And your job is to hug. And your job is to lift up. And your... You want to be used and put your arm around somebody when they walk in and say, hey, what can I help you with? You want to be used of God, just listen to somebody when they need somebody to talk to. Don't open up your mouth, just listen. Sometimes all they need is a listening ear. Sometimes all they need is somebody just to stop and say, I'm here for you. I hope y'all hear this pastor's heart today. Though this house is not filled, it's not full to capacity, I believe and I see it in the spirit that it is coming. I see that it's happening. And I've come to tell this church, Life Restoration Center, that we are moving into a moment where the dove is going to be free and is going to be loosed. So get ready. Don't worry about turning over tables. Just get ready for a moving of the Holy Spirit. Don't worry about turning over tables. Just get ready to see miracles. Don't worry about turning over tables. Just get ready to see restoration. Don't worry about turning over tables. Just get ready to see God move among us. Who's ready for revival? Who's ready to see growth? Who's ready to see an outpouring of the Spirit of God? I'm done. I'm not going to tarry long. I'm going to make a quick altar call. This altar call is for everybody. Whosoever will. If you need God, if you've never experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, if you've never spoken that heavenly language, the language that you didn't know, God wants to fill you with His presence today. If, you, if you're in need of something in your life, whether it's healing in your body, healing in your mind, healing in your emotions, whether it's a situation in your life, in your family, a job situation, a financial situation, it doesn't matter what it is, what's going on. I've come to tell you that God is ready to move in your life. God, y'all ain't hear me yet. I'm telling you the dove is getting ready to be loosed in this house. I'm telling you they're getting ready to be miracles transpiring in this place today. There's getting ready to be an outpouring of the Spirit if you're just ready. Thank you, Lord. I just speak over this church, Father. I speak open hearts. I speak people that need to be in here at this altar, Father. And us, our hands are on them, Father. And that we are going to embrace them and love on them. We are not going to judge them. We are not going to tell them what they need to be changed. We are going to be called to love. Love. Thank you, Father. Bring them to our table. Bring them to our table, Father. Bring them to our table. Open these doors. Let me tell you something. If you don't know, this is Erica. Erica and her husband, Tony, and their daughter came to us, I don't know what, four, five, six weeks ago, something like that. They moved down here from Chicago. And... Uh, their family lived down here and they wanted to be closer to family so they moved down here searching for churches looking on Facebook and on the internet looking for churches somewhere to go and uh, someone asked on one of the pages uh, looking for a church that believes in the fivefold ministry and someone on there put our church and next thing we know they show up and they're here and if you didn't hear what she just said she said driving to church today the Lord showed her a table with him with Jesus sitting at the table and also sitting at the table were drug addicts and prostitutes and people who were broken and people who need Jesus. And she said, now to get in here and get to preaching about Jesus turning over the tables and what we're... Well, Y'all ain't hearing me yet. God is speaking a word into this church that we've got to be ready and prepared for what God is getting ready to do. There is getting ready to be. Come on. 
I said, there's getting ready to be miracles. Uh, there's already been miracles, Sydney. There's already been answered prayers. Uh, there's already been God moving. Uh, there's already been God speaking. Uh, God is already. I just need you to understand and tap in to what God is doing. Quit being concerned about turning over somebody's table and just plug in to the Spirit and let God do everything He wants to do through you. Come on, if you've got a need, I want you to come close. If you've got a need, I want you to come close. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. Come on. It doesn't matter what your need is. God is able. God wants to heal. God wants to deliver. God wants to set free. If you don't have a need, I want you to gather in behind these that do have a need. And I want you to get ready to let faith arise. Come on. I need faith to begin to move in this house. Come on, I need faith to begin to operate in this house. Come on, I need the power of the Spirit to begin to move and begin to operate and do what only God can do. Come on, if God has ever healed you, if God has ever provided for you, if God has ever made a way for you, if God has ever stepped in right on time, then you've got the faith because you know that God is able. You know that God is able. So I want you to begin to activate your faith right now. Come on, begin to activate your faith right now. Come on, come on, lay hands on somebody. Begin to activate your faith. Begin to activate your faith. Come on, come on, let, come on, let the healing flow. Let deliverance flow. Come on, here comes the dove. Here comes the dove. Come on, come on, lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Come on. He corred la Mighty God, right now, God, you've already done a work. God, you've already done a miracle. God, but I'm believing for greater things. I'm believing, oh God, for direction and clarity in the mind. I'm believing, oh God, God, that you're going to order your steps and knowing, oh God, the direction that you would have me to go. God, I speak and I declare right now clarity in the mind and in the heart of God. Complete and healing process. Complete, oh God. Come on, church, pray. Come on, church, pray. Right now, upon the authority of your word and the power that's in the name of Jesus, I declare and speak healing virtue. Begin to flow into this body from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. God, I speak to the heart, and I declare, God, complete healing, complete virtue. Begin to flow and begin to operate, oh God. I speak a miracle in the making. I speak a miracle. Right now, upon the authority of your word and the power that's in the name of Jesus, God, I speak a miracle on her behalf. God, you know the need and you know the situation. I speak right now the doors be open. I speak opportunity. God would present itself on your behalf. God, and will know and understand that it was only by you. And you'll get all the glory. You'll get all the honor. I speak to the job situation right now. God, I speak a better job is on the horizon. I speak more pay is on the horizon. God, you see the work you've called her to do. God, and we need her here on Sundays. God, I declare right now that open doors. God will begin to move and begin to see. Right now, oh God, you know the need and you see the situation. God, there is nothing that is too hard for you. There is nothing that is impossible for you. And so right now, as we place it in your hands, I declare and I decree upon the authority of the Word of God and the power that's in the name of Jesus, I declare a loosing, I declare a releasing right now from every fear and every doubt, God, that has entrapped this mind and this heart. God, I speak peace that surpasses all understanding. I begin, oh God, to speak. Speak.
Come on, church. Come on, I need praying people. Come on, I need people to know how to touch the throne of God. I need people who know how to intercede. Come on, I need some intercessors. Come on, I need some people that know how to travail. I need people who know how to touch God. Right now, oh God, I pray for Daniel. God, you know the need. You see the situation. I speak a miracle, oh God, be birthed in her life. God, I pray right now that every lie from the pit of hell, God, every every spirit that tries to entertain her mind and her thoughts God I come against and I speak the power and the authority of God be loose in her life God I pray a baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire begin to flow and begin to operate oh God come on Come on, church. I declare miracles. I declare miracles. In the power of the name of Jesus. God, I pray for my dear sister right now. God, you see and you understand all that is going on in her life right now. God, and you are no respecter of persons. You are the same God who heals, and you are the same God who delivers, and you are the same God who sets free. God, and so I am declaring... Right now, God, I speak upon the authority of the word, and I declare the power of the name of Jesus over her life. I declare right now that you would loose her and set her free. Right now, oh God, I come against every spirit of depression, every spirit of oppression. God, that is racking her mind and her body. I speak joy in the Holy Spirit, joy unspeakable and full of glory. I speak right now, oh God. In the name of Jesus right now, oh God, you see the turmoil and you see the chaos that has ensued in her life. God, and there is nothing too hard for you and nothing that is impossible for you. And so right now, oh God, I pray in the power of the name of Jesus. And I speak life into her body. I speak life into her mind. I speak life into her emotions. I speak healing to the mind. I speak healing to the emotions. Oh God, the distress that has come into her mind and into her heart. God, I speak a renewing right now in the power of your spirit. God, I pray that you begin to fix and mend everything that has happened in her life, everything that has taken place in her life, oh God. I declare God a mending and a putting back together. But not only are you going to mend, God, but you're going to make whole. God, and you're going to make new again. And it's going to be better than it was before. God is going to... I speak upon the authority of the word of God and the power of the name of Jesus. I declare, let it be, let it be, let it be. In the name of Jesus, somebody shout in the name of Jesus. Now, if you're ready, as the body of Christ, if you're ready to leave the table turning over to Jesus and just be a vessel that is ready to love and show compassion <laughs> and be willing to you be used of God. I want you just to shout to Jesus and say, I'm ready. 
Come on, I want you to say, I'm ready. <laughs> now God heard you. Now God heard you. And I've come to tell you and declare that he's setting the dove free. The Holy Spirit has been loosed in this house. Miracles have been loosed in this house. And people are coming. The broken are coming. The hurting are coming. The alcoholics, the drug addicts, the prostitutes. Come on, they're all coming. And we've got to be ready. Come on, are you ready? Are you prepared? Come on, are you ready to show the love of Jesus? Here comes the church. I said, here comes the church. <laughs> We're not backing down. We're, oh, my Lord, I could preach an hour and tell you that the, the church is not just going to barely get by. Y'all hear me. We're living in the last days. And some people think that, that the church is barely going to get by. And the church is barely going to make it by the skin of their teeth. No, 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 no. Y'all ain't read your Bible. Because in the, the, the end of the book it says we win. And we've got God on our side. The Bible says... <laughs> If God is for us, then who can be against us? Uh, nobody can be against us. Nobody can defeat us. Nobody can conquer. Now hell's going to try, but I've come to tell you that we win. We're going to win. We're going to be victorious, and the church shall see revival and grow. Now, Lord, I thank you for what you've done in this house. Lord, I thank you for every miracle that has taken place. I thank you for every answered prayer. God, I thank you for how you moved, how you've touched, how you've delivered, how you've ministered in this house today. God, we know that we are nothing without you. We've got to have you every moment of every day. God, we can't live, we can't move, we can't breathe without you. God, and so I am praying right now that as your word has been spoken, as it has been delivered, I pray, oh Lord, that it would find good ground. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to open our minds and hearts and receive, oh God, what you've spoken into our, our life here today. God, we want to be ready to be used by you. We want to be ready to welcome those who are broken and those who are hurting, those who are searching for more of you. God, we want to be ready and prepared to love on all those people who need love. God, I pray that you would work through us and operate through us. God, I thank you for confirming your word today. I thank you for how you've spoken into our lives. And I thank you, God, for what you're going to continue to do here among us. I pray, God, that you will bless the food that we're about to partake. I pray that you'll bless the time of fellowship together. God, I pray that you will just cover us and, and continue to give us the favor that we need. Give us favor on our jobs, favor in our homes, favor in our places of business. God, I pray, Jesus, that you'll just continue to cover us. Let your blessings rest upon us, the people of this church. God, we'll be careful to give you glory and honor and praise. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. And the church said, amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Hug someone's neck. Okay, wait. Time out. Psych. Where's Rob? All right, we got one that wants to be baptized. And uh, she knows our, uh, our heater's broke right now. And she knows the water's cold, but she said, let's do it. So I, I, listen, let me tell you, if you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, you need to do so today. The Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other the name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We are only saved by the name of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to baptize her in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of her sins. And I believe God is going to fill her with the Spirit. So if you want to be baptized today, come over here. We'll see us. It'll take you five minutes. It'll take you five minutes, and then we'll go eat and have a good time. Well, hallelujah, somebody.
big bro? While we're getting ready, somebody greet our guests and hug the neck and tell them how much we love them and appreciate that they're here. Listen, even if you can't stay and eat with us, at least go over and grab a plate and take home with you. You can eat it tonight or when you get home or something, whatever you want to do, but don't, don't leave without a plate at least.
Sorry, we're waiting. We're almost there. We're going to do this quick because the water's cold. God, we're so thankful for Denisha. 
Lord, and all that you are doing in her life. God, how you moved upon her life today. God, and what you're continuing to do. God, I pray, Lord, in the days coming that you would order her steps, so oh God, and that you would continue to guide her. God, bring her, Lord, closer to you. God, I pray, Lord, that you would ultimately, oh Lord, fill her with the power of the Holy Spirit. God, and begin to move in her life and show her, oh God, who you are. God, we thank you, God, for the power of your name and all that you're going to do in her life. God, I thank you right now in the power of the name of Jesus. Denisha, because you've repented of your sins in obedience to the word of God, we now baptize you in the name that's above every name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody rejoice. The Lord is filling her with the Holy Spirit right here in the tank. Come on. Come on. She's speaking in tongues right now as the Spirit gives the utterance, just as on the day of Pentecost. Yay! Jesus.